It's the Daily Kebab. Welcome to the Daily Kebab Matanistas. It is day five. Now, before we go and talk about football, I want those of you who live in Manchester, and particularly South Manchester, to pay attention to the restaurant behind me. We are next to Burnage Station in South Manchester, and I haven't just morphed here from Madrid. I travelled over today. And just next door to the station, we have the Sarabi Indian Street Food Restaurant. Okay, some of you might want some better surroundings than this, but the area in which we're located is fine. I walk here, I like the food here, and please take it on me that this is a restaurant you ought to visit. And I have to say, Madrid was borderline t-shirt weather. This is really cold and unpleasant, so it's possible I might be going away somewhere in a few days to bring you more daily kebabs. Anyway, I'm going to start off by talking about the game I didn't talk about much yesterday, Belgium against Canada. I watched the first half and I had to catch up with the second half in the morning. And I have to say, Canada did completely outplay Belgium. I don't know where the Belgian legs had gone to, but they're not looking good at all. I thought they'd be better than that, but I guess your Alderweireld and Vertonghen's are getting on a bit. I suppose when Belgium have these two big players who can pull the match out for them, Courtois and De Bruyne, even though De Bruyne didn't have a good game, didn't deserve the Man of the Match award, they're probably still quite a difficult team to beat. Canada played beautifully. I did not expect that at all. But I have to say, if there are any of you who support Canada and one of the teams, Real Madrid, knocked out last season, you must be sick of the sight of Thibaut Courtois. And I would say Canada do have chances of getting points from their other games, so not out of it yet by any means. And today we kicked off with another poor game, Switzerland against Cameroon. The only thing that changed was there was actually a goal. I guess this is something that's a feature of many World Cups, reasonable defences and midfields, but an inability to string attacks together and put the ball in the back of the net. But this is taking it too far this time. There hardly seems to be a good attack in the tournament. Uruguay against South Korea wasn't a bundle of fun either. I thought the Koreans would produce more than they did. And apart from hitting the post, I have to say there wasn't too much about that game either. So we're going to move on to something which was a bit more exciting. Portugal against Ghana. I thought the penalty was very, very questionable. I suppose they know more than I do, and it looked very, very close. I couldn't tell. Anyway, so Portugal went ahead, and Ronaldo scored a penalty. It seems like some of these ageing stars, the only way they can score at the moment is from the penalty spot. And the game was drifting off into a whole heap of boredom until Ghana suddenly got an equaliser from Andre Ayew, who will be familiar to supporters of Swansea City, and people will have seen him playing in the Premier League for Swansea in the past. But then he got taken off, and wow, what a bad reaction he had to being taken off. And just a few minutes later, Ghana did the one thing that you should never do against that Portuguese team. Yes, they've had the same manager for God knows how long. You just don't give them transitions and let them count you because they are lethal at that. And, of course, two more goals came along from very, very similar counter-attacks caused by Ghana giving away the ball in terrible places. Ghana then got one back and those of you who watched the game will have seen the comical scenes at the end where the Portuguese keeper didn't see the guy behind him who run up, took the ball and then slipped Otherwise, there would have been a shock three all draw there. And in the last game, Brazil against Serbia, a 2 0 win to Brazil. And they did look pretty good, actually, I have to say, although some of the finishing was pretty poor. That might cost them against better teams later on in the tournament, particularly teams that manage the ball well. Because I have to say, Serbia didn't manage the ball well and were pressed to death. Overhead kick from Richarlison. Never saw him do anything like that for Everton, although maybe if you're an Everton fan you can correct me here. And I did say yesterday they don't tend to mess up their group games, Brazil. I can't remember when they ever did. So not a surprise there that they stole to a 2-0 win. 
as for my predictions for those games, well, I got the first one wrong and the second one wrong because I went for a draw between Switzerland and Cameroon and then I thought the Koreans might outpace an ageing Uruguay star, especially with Sun Ming Hun on the pitch. But not so. I did get the result of the portugal Ghana game right, uh, but I didn't get the score right. I went for 2-0 with Portugal slowly grinding down Ghana instead of the 3-2, and the 2-0 and slowly grinding down happened in the last game, but I did go for 3-1. Anyway, the predictions were rubbish, but fortunately the food and drink here is good. And I'm starting off with a glass of Salty Lassie. So I've ordered my starters and main are being prepared, so I'll now carry on with tomorrow's predictions. Now, we have four games as usual, but the difference is that tonight was the last of the teams that had played their first round game. So we're going back to teams who have already played. So in Group A, we have Qatar against Senegal. I saw absolutely nothing from Qatar against a pretty solid but unspectacular Ecuador team. So I am going to go here for a 2-0 win to Senegal. Senegal surely need to push players up front and gamble. This is a game they need to win if they're going to have any hope of qualifying. Now the second game, Netherlands against Ecuador. Now the Netherlands have three points in the bag and whilst you'd expect them to beat Ecuador, all things being equal, I think they'll be quite happy with the point given their third game is against Qatar. They weren't inspiring up front against Senegal and the, the Ecuadorian reputation of being barnacles on a rock is anything to go by. I think they'll hold out and get a draw here, so I'm going to go for a nil-nil draw. Although it wouldn't be the biggest shock in the world if the Ecuadorians actually managed to nick one here. And finally, England's group. Now, Wales did well to come back after playing pretty badly in the first half against the United States. But I don't think Iran are as bad as people think they are after that game against England. I know they have issues with their coach, but I think they might put in a performance here and Wales might struggle again, but they'll get a 1-1 draw. I think Wales will need something from their last game. And then finally, England-USA. Well, let's hope Southgate carries on with this positive style of play, which was a complete surprise to me after the garbage I'd been watching him churn out in the Nations League. So, I'm full of optimism here. The USA don't have a bad team by any means, but I think we have players in every position to cater for them. Our players play first-team football all the time. Some of theirs don't. So, a comfortable 2-0 win for England. Okay, enough football, time for the food and drink. And for those who don't know, a lot of you obviously will, Lassi is a yoghurt and milk drink from South Asia. A lot of Middle Eastern countries also have yoghurt drinks. And here, I asked for the salty version. You can have sweetened or you can have mango Lassi, but I like the salty one. And I love the way they sprinkle cumin over the top of it. And yes, in case you're wondering, I don't take alcohol every day and with every meal. Well, the first dish is about to arrive, Matanistas, and what makes this restaurant unique around here is that instead of serving Anglo-Indian food, they serve Indian-Indian food, which is a rarity in these parts. So here we have, folks, paneer tikka, Indian cottage cheese marinated and grilled or baked in the tandoor. This restaurant does have a wonderful selection of tandoori offerings, most of the meat, but it says everything about the quality of the paneer and the marination here that, as a meat eater, I've gone for the vegetarian kebab. And of course paneer is a very, very mild cheese and it should be firm without being flaky, but the secret is it's a cheese that is beautifully receptive to soaking up the flavours of said marination. That is delectable. It's quite spicy as well. And for those of you who don't know this, when you go to an Indian restaurant, they should be able to alter the spiciness of their kebabs as well as their curries. And on the side, we have tamarind chutney, coriander chutney, and some yogurt. 
Although I have to say, I think this paneer is good enough without having to add anything. Incidentally, I have tried the meat offerings and they're very good as well. This just happens to be my favourite starter here. And I'll tell you something else, Buttonistas. Paneer used to be something I wouldn't touch with a barge pole. I wouldn't say I actively disliked it, but I always found it very, very bland. But when it's done correctly, it is different gravy. And the same kind of applies for my main course. And that dish is biryani. I have gone for the Lucknow style, or Lucknowy, I think that's the correct adjective, style lamb biryani. And on the right you can see something called Rider, which is a yoghurt that's supposed to moisten and cool the rice. But my experience of the rice here is that it's so good that it doesn't need any writer. And I must add, they asked me whether I liked it spicy. I wasn't going to say no to that, was I? So proper biryani is usually cooked in the dum style, which means it's cooked in a big pot with the meat at the bottom, the spices layered on top, and then the rice layered on top of that, cooked for quite a while so that the rice infuses all of the meaty flavours and spices. Unfortunately, biryani is something that's butchered way too often in the UK and people just fry up a bit of rice and make some sort of little pillow for you whilst describing it on their menu as a biryani. But here it is the real deal mutton easters. Quite delectable. It's spicy but that writer is going nowhere near it. It's that good. Anyway, I'm going to polish this off mutton easters. I'll be back tomorrow to review the games, give you more predictions and I might even take you to a pub where there'll be partisan support for England. But until then, folks, that was your Daily Kebab.